Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello, mere mortality is our theme today. Later in the programme, we're going to be dissecting, with the writer Di Smith, the mighty cadaver of working-class South Wales, the society of heavy industry, music, sport, politics and vivid argument that is, I fear, no longer quite with us. By remembering, can we freeze the seeds of a culture and regrow them later? Before that, we're going to be talking about scientific fantasies, including overcoming human limits, with the sci-fi author Paul Macaulay, whose work tests the boundaries and politics of hard science, and the anthropologist Kathleen Richardson, who devotes her time to studying not humans, but robots, or possibly humans studying robots. But first, though, the philosopher John Gray on the Immortalisation Commission, Science and the Strange Quest to Cheat Death, which is a study of Victorian and Edwardian psychics and Soviet would-be supermen and the more modern dream of uploading human minds into machines. John, you cover a vast range of different attitudes uh, to immortalisation in this, in this short book. Let's just start with the sort of late Victorian Edwardian psychics and, and automatic writing. This was, um, by your account, very much driven by the high mortality, not just of the First World War, but remarkable numbers of people dying quite early of typhus or whatever, um, you know, relatively young, and a desperate desire to replace fading religion with something else. That's right. Um, In the late Victorian and Edwardian periods, religion had lost its emotional hold of uh, large sections of educated people, the intellectual elite, but also large sections of... Um, the middle classes, and um, all of these, the whole society really was, in a sense, um, under the spell of science, and in particular of Darwinism. And what Darwinism had revealed was a world in which when individual humans died, they vanished, uh, and the human species would eventually be extinct. And that vision at a time when we tend to forget infant mortality was still very high. Mm. Uh, People lost lovers and fiancés, husbands, wives and so on at a rate which we can hardly imagine. There was a tremendous amount of um, uh, almost unbearable grief. And several of the people involved in these, to us, rather incredible experiments, people like Arthur the politician Arthur Balfour's brother, also a conservative politician, Mm. but who gave a politics to devote his life to the study of the paranormal, and many others, including many women who had lost children in early years or uh, lost loved ones, were involved in um, psychical research, and in particular in this practice of automatic writing, in which it seemed to them that minds other than their own, including the minds of loved ones who'd passed on, um, uh, were uh, communicating with them uh, Mm. by their hand moving and revealing messages, uh, messages which um, uh, offered consolation, offered meaning and offered hope. So uh, what I think um, it's important to realise is that for pretty well all of the people involved in this practice... Uh, It was a form of science. It was conceived to be science, not religion, because for them, science was the authority. So they turned to science, if you like, for an exit from the meaningless world that science had revealed. It's a poignant story in many ways because it is driven by intense yearning and emotion a lot of the time, but it is uh, unintentionally, from time to time, comic as well. And you tell the extraordinary story of... The, the idea of creating a spirit child, a real child who is going to be a sort of future world leader. Yes, one of the most extraordinary uh, uh, um, episodes in, in this period, um, uh, the Edwardian period, is concerns um, the belief among a number of leading psychical researchers that uh, uh, deceased scientists were engaged in a, um, a eugenic experiment on the other side whereby a child would be designed on the other side and appear in our world with extraordinary capacities and abilities, so extraordinary that this this, Mm. uh, person could transform the world and bring peace to it. Now, there is a kind of subtext to this, which is that the two... the, the key automatist involved in this was a woman, a Welsh suffragette, actually, 
uh, but also uh, someone intensely interested in art and also the British representative at the League of Nations who practiced under a pseudonym. She was someone who'd lost uh, a child in in infancy, someone with what was described as a strong predilection to paternity, married to an older man, who we now uh, believe uh, uh, produced the child as a result of a covert relationship Mm. with Gerald Balfour, Balfour's brother. But the very idea that on the other side, as it were, scientific progress was advancing more quickly than on in the earth, so that on the earth, so that this child could be produced, and one was produced. Let Hen- Henry Coombe Tennant. Henry Coombe Tennant. Henry Coombe Tennant. Yes. A child did emerge, uh, not it seems by virgin birth, uh, and uh, had an interesting life. He Welsh Guards, Second World War, it says here, captured in France, cap- spent two years in German prison camps. Prison camps, um, later entered uh, um, the Secret Intelligence Service, worked with uh, Kim Philby. Uh, after the war, did a bit more of that, then quit to become a monk at Downside. And became a monk for most of his the rest of his most life. Of so in a sense, he was interested in immortality and Im- immortalisation <laughs> in, a, in, in a rather different way. Indeed, but he doesn't yeah. seem to have known of his own ro- the role that had been assigned to him, oh. or not fully, or not till late in life. Now, you then uh, jump on in the study to look at the, the catastrophically uh, murderous and bloodthirsty uh, Bolshevik belief that you could get, an, get rid of enough bad humans and eventually you'll create better humans and sort of possibly even superhumans and the strange story of, of Lenin's um, uh, pickling, mm. um, I think we could call it. Um, but I'd like to jump on towards the end of the book mm. where um, you raise the idea of the singularity, which is much talked about, Kurtzfeil, um, the notion that a human consciousness, not simply um, the information in the brain, but actually consciousness, will eventually be downloaded uh, in some fashion onto a, a computer system which would then allow that consciousness, yours or mine or anybody else's, to live forever. Yes, the American writer Ray Kurzweil is widely influential and um, he's a more radical proponent of immortality through science than earlier groups, who've, some of which still continue, who proposed to uh, that humans achieve immortality by having their bodies or, or their brains frozen and then resurrected later and repaired. And for him... Freezing is not really good, is it? It doesn't work very freezing well. Da- freezing tends to damage yeah. in, 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 uh, uh, the, the bodies, the cadavers and so on, and the brains. Uh, but in the Kurzweil, there's a more um, radical notion. It's that, as you say, uh, um, human consciousness will be somehow stored on a computer and then uploaded. Uh, that individual human consciousness can be uploaded into a a cyber realm where these consciousnesses can have whatever bodies they want. And for me, this is very like the Victorian and Edwardian spiritual Summerland, because in that land, Summerland, you have a body, but it's not the body you had before. It doesn't have arthritis or warts. Uh, it's not ugly. Mm. It's somehow an enhanced version of your body. But, of course, um, Kurzweil is even more radical. He says you don't just have to have one uh, virtual body. You can have as many as you like. The key thing, though, in all of this is the idea that new technologies, technologies in this case of the internet and of um, cyberspace, will enable humans to escape the natural limitations that go with being an animal of the kind that Darwin described. And uh, therefore that original uh, intolerance of the the Darwinian vision of eventual death and so on, the the inability to accept that. It's as strong today as it ever was. As strong today. Uh, We've had plenty of biologists um, uh, on this programme over the years who've uh, ridiculed the idea, Paul McCauley, we're going to come on to your um, science fiction in a moment, of of the singularity of being able to download a consciousness onto silicon because they insist again, and no doubt rightly, that the brain is, after all, an embodied, um, fleshly, um, bony, part of a fleshly and bony structure and can't be removed from it. Um, but mm. this is it's an idea that in, in your world, in science fiction, just won't go away, is it? Will it? No, and also that it's a tremendously easy to interface with machines by simply plugging yourself in through the little node in the back of your neck has, has been prevalent for quite a while now as well. Um, as science fiction writers always like, there's, there's two ways of looking at this. First of all, that it's, first of all, the technology is, is, is friction free. You know, as it seems with Kurzweil assumes with this kind of weasel world, word download that, which encompasses an enormous amount of difficulty and problems which you know, the biologists would be getting at. It's much more like, a, I think probably they'd say it's more like a simulation than a download because you'd have to simulate every, the state of every neuron 
and you could only approximate that simulation. This is the big objection to it. So anything you do is only an approximation. It's not an accurate model. It's not a replica. Kurzweil seems to think that you can just replicate things that, in the same way that you can copy you know, the information on a CD onto a hard drive and then back again. But a lot which, of science fiction yeah. seems to me to be driven by some of the same mm. instincts of driving the characters in uh, John Gray's book, um, in the sense of the belief that eventually we'll be able to cheat death or at least cheat our natural limitations and push beyond. Yeah, um, I, I, th I think a lot of science fiction is about death, actually, or cheating death or confronting death, not only the death of of yourself or the human species, but also, you know, the heat death of the universe, which um, was discovered around about about 50 years later after yeah. Darwin. You know, there's another big thump there that the universe isn't going to go on forever, that the Earth isn't going to go on forever, that there's a finite time, the sun will gutter out. If we go to other stars, fine, but they will gutter out too. And eventually the whole universe will gutter out and uh, mm. there'll be nothing left for life to cling on to. John used the word sinister yeah. earlier on, yeah. and, and I think what is quite sinister, H.G. Wells with figures in your, your book, mm. it, there's a narcissism there as well, isn't mm. there? Uh -huh. I mean, it seems to me that they are ignoring uh, the specificity of other human beings, mm. I mean, other than their own. So mm. in, in Winifred Coombe Tennant's business of, of um, what did Nicole Kidman say? She was a gestation carrier or for, for the Messiah. Mm. Um, but in real life, I mean, she was embracing Wales and the nationalised Stetherwood and sometimes Lloyd George, uh, as, as, if that, <laughs> as if that was the afterworld, or perhaps it was, you know, here and then. Uh, and yet, when we go to Wells, you have this kind of progressivism which melds into, uh, you know, the appalling crimes uh, committed in, in this instance uh, within the, the lands of the Soviet Union, uh, because other human beings are not human in, in, their, in their mind. I think other humans are radically imperfect versions of a kind of ideal humanity, which is a projection of their own image they would like to have of themselves, that they see developing in the future. So, so they're not really interested in um, actual human beings, not even... You could, not, I mean, you could yeah. have, uh, just jumping in, yeah. I mean, you, could, you could have equally gone to the, the Nazi uh, mm. experiments and mm. talked about the perfect Aryan that was eventually going to be created if you waited long enough the and got rid of all the... The difference, is that, the difference is that the Bolsheviks weren't racists. Yeah. Mm. Um, but it is... Uh, so there's a profound difference in that respect. And the killing in the Soviet Union, although it was on a colossal scale, didn't involve... Um, the uh, type of genocide that occurred in um, in the Nazi lands, but where they were similar, and it came, comes out quite explicitly in um, um, uh, in Trotsky, is Trotsky explicitly envisaged um, using what he called psychophysical experimentation to create a higher human being. And Gorky, and I cite this in the book, write, wrote to Stalin saying, um, "Don't be too squeamish about the methods. We need to experiment on what he called." Human units. Human units, just a disgusting phrase. Mm. Um, we're going to come on to robots, which actually kind of fit into all of this in the politics as well as the, the time scale um, uh, I, I, in a moment, Kathleen. But um, the quest to cheat death is also part of the, the history of the robotic. Well, very well, interesting, because tomorrow is the 90th anniversary of the robot, which was a character in the play... Um, called R.U.R. Rossum's Universal Robots. And in it, there's a, there's a strong sense of terminus and human destruction. So um, in the play, the, um, the robots eventually do all the human labour, apparently fitting in with this idea that if machines did our labour, then we'd have more freedom to go and explore our kind of uh, interests. And But as machines do... Well, as the robots, they weren't actually machines at this point... <laughs> As the uh, robots do more and more labour, then they eventually become more powerful and they rebel and take over society, and that is the end of the human uh, species, mm. basically. Mm. So the themes of Terminus are very much then and now still very much intimately connected with the idea of the, um, of the robot. Um, you could say there's almost a culture of death surrounding it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, I mean, we're absolutely on the edge between... Um, the physical world in which we live and, and a fantasy world. And it's, as we've demonstrated, it's about the, f the fear of death drives us over that edge, which takes us to Paul Macaulay's um, writing, your science fiction writing, Paul. Um, explain to us, um, you would describe yourself certainly most of the time as a hard science mm. fiction writer. You're, you're using hard science in your books, dealing with a lot of these themes. 
What is the definition of a hard science fiction writer as opposed to, I suppose, a soft science fiction writer? Well, I suppose it's it's playing within the rules of what's known. Um, you know, you can start extrapolating wildly from what's known, but you start with a common ground that's shared. Uh, amongst scientists, uh, you know, uh, a good example would be um, using the speed of light, um, that you don't violate Einsteinian prin- principles when you're travelling. If you want to get your character to star, they're going to have to spend at least, say, four, four years to travel four light years. They can't go faster than light because we know at present you can't go faster than light. It's impossible. Mm. Uh, you can, you can. Uh, other science fiction writers think, well, that's uh, to get the story going. We will just get around that. But um, uh, mm. so then you become slightly. So you that, give that yourself would be a slightly those softer limits. version. Yes. Yeah, so you give yourself those bit, those limits, and and actually, you know, that you can play within those limits. That makes it quite interesting because you, you then um, get into all kinds of problems. How do you, how do you construct a ship that's going to last that long? I mean, four years is like the minimum time to get to the nearest star at the speed of light, assuming you can. Get up to speed of light instantly, and then get down to the speed of, from the speed of light to rest again instantly. Um, but it would, in fact, probably be much, much longer than that. And again, this comes into the idea of, of, of death. I mean, how do you, how, how in the normal human lifespan do you do you comprehend these vast interstellar distances? We can, you know, we, we're, we're quite... you, got, you, you wake your people up yeah. after these long travels with appalling stomach cramps and bowel yeah. disorders, and, so and that's on. that's just the trip from you know Earth to um, Jupiter, which is a mere bagatelle compared to actual interstellar distances. Um, and you, we, we've also talked, uh, touched on, on on robotics, but you've got a very interesting instance, for instance, where you've got fighter pilots in, in, in one of your books who have to be re-engineered to increase the speed of their reactions, which is coming close to some of the sort of engineering that we've been talking about in the singularity. Yeah, um, there's two. I suppose there's two ways. The first way of, of looking at re-engineering is to make yourself much more of an ideal human being, which is what I talked about earlier, but the other way of doing it is to make yourself more of an ideal kind of machine, and the fighter pilot idea was to try and fit them into the kind of kind of machines they're going to operate in the same way that the Apollo, uh, Mercury and Apollo astronauts were selected and tested r- r- very relentlessly and, and, and brutally to, to basically become switch-throwing monkeys. You know, that they, they, they were... The first astronauts in the American program were chimps who were trained to throw certain switches when the lights came on to show that they could mm. work in, in zero G. And the, and the scientists, um, some of whom came from Germany, Nazi Germany, had the same idea that the astronauts would, were, were basically what the astronauts called spam in a can. They were just um, there to throw switches. The astronauts, of course, rebelled against this because there was this, there's this romantic notion, which I obviously share, putting fighter pilots you know, in, in, in advanced spaceships. Um, that you should have some human element there. It was important to have these kind of knights riding mm. off into, into, into the wild blue yonder representing humanity. And, and, therefore and so in your should, yeah. case, the, 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 the brain is enhanced and the, and, and the neural yeah. systems are speeded up. Through... Yeah, you're given this kind of secondary neur- nervous system which takes over this kind of secondary self, which is kind of sinister shadow self mm. that does the operations, yeah. Your books, and, and indeed a lot of science fiction, actually, um, also has a strong political element. We've touched on politics quite mm. a lot already, but um, one of the things you seem to be doing is asking political questions, um, not quite like the Soviets, but you're asking about how, how the, the limits of, of uh, human uh, cooperation and adaptability. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, was, what was it? I, I started with a couple of novels um, thinking about what... Um, Looking at all the lovely pictures that came back from Cassini um, about the moon of, of the moons of Saturn, and, and wondering what it would be like to walk around there. As soon as you put a human being there, you, you immediately have this kind of, kind of trail. How do they get there? Um, why are they there? And you know, how do they live? And in an environment like that, was incredibly hostile. There's no air. It's it's very very cold. Um, the obvious answer is, well, they'd have to cooperate, and you immediately start thinking of places like Antarctica, places where, where you're entirely uh, dependent on technology to survive. If technology doesn't work, you're going to die. Mm. Um, if you don't cooperate with, your, your, with everybody around you and they don't cooperate with you, again, you know, you're you rely die. on the survivor, you're going to die. So um, I, the society was kind of, kind of built up from that kind of idea of cooperation. While you've got um, figures in your books who... Uh, may not live forever, but live for very, very long lifespans, 180, 200 mm. years and so on, you're obviously worried about the inequality aspect of it because you've also got sort of serfs and slaves. Mm. In other words, you suggest that if um, we ever advance, if that's the right word, which it's not, to a humanity which is enhanced and very, very long living, it will be at the price of other people, um, the majority, 
who can't be like that and are just used as objects towards that. Yeah, as I mean, Vide H.G. Wells. Mm, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suppose actually, I on, on we always go back to H.G. Wells mm. because he came up with most of this stuff first, mm. you know. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly, um, the idea that if you're going to live longer, you're, you're gaining some kind of capital, you're accumulating stuff. I mean, uh, it's, it's very unlikely you're going to have long-lived people who are, are, are very poor living as beggars. You know, this would be rather difficult. So it's much more likely that the people who are mm. going to live longest are those who have also got a lot of stuff to, to begin with. Which takes yeah. us neatly to robots <laughs> and Kathleen, because the word robot is one of the relatively rare words in English, which is Czech mm. uh, in origin, and it, it means... To work slavishly. Merely it's to a, work slavishly. It's um, the extra labour. It's a feudal term. It's the extra labour that um, that the serf used to give, actually. So it's that extra labour. And interestingly, um, you know, the idea of the robot was also a very political character. It was um, in the 1920s, the kind of context that inspired it was the Russian Revolution, the First World War, Fordism, this kind of obsession with... Um, with kind of labour and production. So there was definitely a political entity because sometimes we think of Terminator and we think of Hollywood depictions of it as this kind of creature and it's stripped of all its... Um... And the Carl, the Carl Chapek play, which is where it comes from, yeah. it's, the, the robots are not actually machines at all. They're, they're, they're biological living uh, humans but without full consciousness, is that uh, right? I think this is... Um... You know, one of the most interesting things about the play, because um, obviously the Fordist production line was um, just taking off around the world. I mean, even in the Soviet Union, they kind of celebrated that Fordist approach to manufacture mm. and production. So in the play, the human bodies are assembled on a production line. So, But it's it's biological material that's assembled. And what was quite interesting is that um, the first depictions of the play, if anyone looks at any pictures, they'll see robots that look identical to people. But by the end of the 20s, what happened was other artists, you've got to remember in the 20s, the kind of machine metaphor, that science almost taking hold of the kind of imagery... Um, the machine was transformed, I'm sorry, the robot was transformed into a machine. So by the end of the 20s, early 30s... They're clanking. Uh, that's right. <laughs> and, and, post, uh, and then from there, um, you can really see that most of our concepts of machines are robots are machines. But, um, you know, interestingly, uh, you know, this, this kind of idea of the robot as a human entity, or where the boundaries lay... You know, was is there very, from the start. Was there from the start. And you, I mean, you've your research. Um, although you're an anthropologist, you're an anthropologist looking as much at robots as you are at people. Um, and for those of us who are beginning to get slightly uneasy and possibly scared about this kind of chilly uh, post-human future, um, you would say when it comes to robots, don't worry your pretty little heads. No. <laughs> Um, when I first entered a robot lab back in 2003, I actually thought that um, from my childhood I had this kind of idea of robots being very sophisticated. And, um, and when I arrived there, I realised that actually they're not very sophisticated at all. In fact, some of the imagery that we see in popular culture and the media about robots are all kind of videotaped, um, perfect representations of robots working. And if anyone does actually interact with the robot, they'll know that it breaks down and this is why this Ray Kurzweil idea. I mean, machines are continually breaking down, code is continually going wrong um, and, and so I don't think we have to worry quite yet about the robot revolution, if ever. In fact, if anything, it's reinforced my notion that being human is very unique and distinctive, if anything. Mm. The more terrible to be downloaded and then somebody just simply changed the plug to do some hoovering <laughs> and you've gone. <laughs> Well, I After kind, all that effort. You know, I kind of think this idea about science, sometimes we recycle kind of very kind of fundamental human ideas about existence, but we recycle them in new forms. Yes. And, you know, this kind of idea that you can download your consciousness. Well, you know, when Marx wrote Capital, presumably he downloaded an aspect of his consciousness into a thing, didn't he? And mm. when we create objects in our society, we're always downloading or, if you like, writing down, as um, my friend said, our consciousness or creating things. So a apart from the robots that are simple assembly machines um, working, working in factories on production lines, which we all understand, where do you think the sort of growth of robotics is going to go? Because you've talked about social robotics. 
I think social robotics is the the biggest departure from our kind of conventional notions of robotics. And I say that because, once again, when I, I kind of had an idea that the interest in humanoid robots was motivated by this desire to kind of assist people and help people. Now, obviously, John, you've uh, highlighted problems with that in different cultures and... But, um, but there are some good examples of robots which can do those kind of things, from pets to carers. Well, interestingly... Um, when we kind of imagine the robot, it was as a worker, has something that did a task. Now the task that the social robot seems to do is engage in a social interaction with the person. Now um, we then have to question whether we need machines to have social re- interactions with, and um, particularly um, a group in society that these robots have been tested on are the elderly, for example. And, you know, elderly people have that um, issue that they lose their siblings, they lose family members. As they grow old, in fact, their human relationships diminish. And for that group of people then to, like, have robots as their kind of social solution, I think it's problematic. I can imagine. There I've got my Kindle and and that's a machine which helps me to read. And I can imagine a version of a Kindle which talks back to me. And where I say that, you know, that's enough trollop. Can we go to some Thomas Hardy or whatever it is? And they say, OK, all right then, um, because it's programmed to do so and reads it back. But that wouldn't be a robot. That would simply be another machine. I'm just wondering about the the, the definition of robot now. Well, it's a, it's a kind of a vague definition because a robot is a machine, mm. um, but we imagine it to have some kind of um, mobility, some movement, something it can kind of do, some action that it can do. Um, but there really is no difference between a humanoid robot and your washing machine. They're both machines. However, there's something very fascinating that happens, and as an anthropologist, uh, we, we look at this. Once you start um, crafting human characteristics on things, people start to attribute all kinds of qualities to it. I'd like to ask both you and Paul um, whether there is any evidence at all, of uh, so far, of robotics or machines learning fast enough to actually be described as intelligent in any meaningful way? Um, I would say from... I'm not a scientist, mm-hmm. so um, I'm sure there are uh, there might be people who disagree, but in my interactions with scientists, I would say no. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are some robots that can do very simple learning tasks. They can They can figure out how to get around a block on a floor, for instance, but... Not, not much more than that. I mean, I'm kind of interested in, in the fact that robots have to have bodies because anybody who's used social media like Twitter will be, have found all kinds of sort of spam bots and things like that which pretend to be human, you know, Twitter users but actually are there to disseminate ads for you know, diets and things like that. And um, perhaps that's one way that uh, intelligence might accidentally uh, uh, come up is, is not, um, you know, scientists in a lab designing robots but... Um, um, ad people designing, you know, ad robots that uh, mm. people eventually can't tell the difference between a robot that's talking to you on the internet and uh, and another person. Mm. You know. mm. I was quite uh, interested in, in yeah. the cultural things that Kathleen was talking about as well, casting my mind back to mm. robots that were kind. I mean, in, in my childhood, it was Robbie the Robot on Forbidden yeah. Planet, mm. Um, mm. which, of course, comes from The Tempest and, and, and is aerial. Mm. Um, and then that takes you into John's distinctions, not distinctions, but the drawing together of magic and science. Mm. And it, it, in the early 1950s, there was a game called The Magic Robot, which I think came from the States, which is a little green figure that you put on one set of magnet, on one set of, of a piece of paper, and it asked the question. They put him on the other side, and he went to the question. And at the same time as that was being marketed... It, the magic robot in Britain. They were also marketing something that Eamon Andrews had brought out called the Great Marvello, who was a wizard with a wand, doing exactly the same thing. Mm. So, and I, mm. I just have a feeling that particularly mm. with robots, this, these issues of what can they do magically for you mm. and what can they do scientifically is maybe still a confusion. It also seems that every time there is a scientific advance, the sort of innate um, poetic, religious um, uh, aspects of our personality want to seize it and extend it endlessly um, to to some sort of um, death-cheating transcendence. I suppose the basic project of magic is to overleap natural boundaries 
transgress them so that we are more powerful, uh, not mortal, uh, and we can have all the good things without any of the bad things. And as Dice pointed out, um, many of the ideas of... some of the ideas of robotics and many subsequent ideas have that characteristic. And I'd say that the confusion of science with magic is not a sort of ailment of our culture that we can hope to cure. It's sort of encrypted in modern life because with the retreat of religion, which contains, if you like, elements of magic, the idea that we can somehow come back with our own bodies but they're better bodies and in a different world but without all the sorrows mm -hmm. of this world and so on. These are kind of half magical ideas. These ideas have been channeled into science and I agree with you, Andrew. Andrew. I mean, it's mm -hmm. exactly that way. Whenever there's an advance, and of course many of these advances are useful, it might be the case, as we've just been discussing, that some of these robots mm -hmm. can be useful in some contexts for old people who've lost their human relationships and human networks. Mm -hmm. I'm not sort of adamantly saying that no, they might turn... But what they can't do is get round, as it were, the, the essential... Limits of our, the, the limits of our, our, of our human life. situation, of our fleshly life. They can't, well, the idea that they can is magic. Well let's, turn, well, let's turn to a land of magic. Let's turn to a land of magic <laughs> and, and a place which certainly demonstrates that the, the joys and the sorrows cannot be disconnected or unlinked. South Wales, at the turn of the, the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, the Welsh California, Gold mm. Rush territory uh, die. Um, in your part of South Wales in particular, English speaking by and large, um, but a real sense of boomtown and wildness um, from the coal fields. Yeah, and, and I, I think one of the things about Welsh history is, is where it's still misunderstood, is that the images of the 30s, you know, the hunger marches and the grainy newsreel, is still what sort of visits uh, the sense of Wales, whereas if you look at it in, in a different, if you like, in a, in a longer time span, let's say from the 1890s to the 1920s, you have an extraordinarily dynamic global capitalist society, uh, one with boom and bust, um, huge amounts of immigrants coming in, as well as the Welsh transmigrating internally. We don't go to America like the Irish. We, we find American Wales within Wales. And that, in turn, led to um, the formation of what were meant to be consensual and stable communities under liberal politics and nonconformist religion. And, of course, it breaks apart. Mm, um, very quickly. It, it breaks apart because of the pressures and, if you like, the massification. And then those other um, pulses of that history happen later on you know, down the road. I sometimes feel, look, looking at, at Paul, that, that s Wales was living... Um, in a kind of a dystopia, a real dystopia, but aspiring to a utopia, or at least in forms of its socialist politics and unionism, looking for ways out of, of what were sometimes robotic conditions. And, um, you know, if you, if you look at the mass workforce in South Wales, 290,000 coal miners alone in 1920, and then you add to that, you know, the people dependent upon that army. So you had aggregations of people brought together for the purposes of work who, and, and this in some senses is the burden of, of my book, um, form themselves into congregations and communities. And then the rest of the book really is about um, this long dying, I was going to say downloading, consciousness <laughs> mm. in the novelists and the painters and the photographers who try to give us, or I argue, they try to give us, articulate an expression of that society which is extraordinarily vibrant and ultimately, Lo I stick my neck out, valid. Loquacious, highly literate, musical, um, and in some respect, at any rate, artistic, um, you you start the book um, with a particular moment in time, a very, very specific, brief, frozen moment in time where you find your own grandfather mm. in a crowd in Tony Pandy. Mm. Just tell us a little bit about why that moment in time, apart from the personal connection, is so important in the story of South Wales. Well, the importance is because what occurred in Tony Pandy in 1910, um, the riots of Tony Pandy, which happened over two days, there were further instances, was tied into a very long and difficult uh, industrial dispute. Now, if you imagined in a counterfactual sense that the riots hadn't happened, that the commercial and, and social fabric of the township hadn't been destroyed, so it was just an industrial dispute, it would still be very important because it led, amongst other things, to the minimum wage strike of 1912. Um, there were theories of workers' control, nationalisation or all the familiars, if you will. But what happened in Tonopandi broke um, the accepted bounds. You had people turning on, as it was said, uh, their own 
kind, and the shopkeepers and the chemists who, who dealt with them. And traditionally, this had been seen as a, a mob of drunken marauders or socialist-inflamed ideologues or strangers coming for a bit of fun. And what I uh, discovered, I hope, uh, in my historical work was that it, it wasn't that. It was really... Um, Enough is enough. It was a kind of a, a code. That a lot of these shopkeepers were, were were renting out sure. um, properties at exorbitant rates. It was it was a, it was an eruption against the whole system. Yes, it, it deeply implicated um, the whole, if you like, class integration, mm. and that's what upset Churchill. Was the Home Secretary? Troops did come to Tonopandi. That's what upset Edwardian Wales, but also, if you like, moderate um, socialists like Keir Hardy, who incidentally also was a spiritualist in 1915, <laughs> um, and, and yeah. the, the frozen moment, Andrew, was, um, you know, we were celebrating Tonopandi, if you will, in Wales last year, and um, I'd looked at that photograph of striking miners uh, going into a mass meeting, and I'd looked at it many times over the years, because there's thousands of people in the photograph, and I suddenly did see in a clearer image my own grandfather. Mm, he's got your nose and eyes. I can, <laughs> I can, I'm, he's sitting in front of me now, though. Well... Better, ca- I can't tell about the hair because he's got a big no. cap on, like they all did. Um, it's a it, kind of scary photograph in a sense because it, they are so masked, so uniform. Yes. You know, what the hell are they going to do? Well, we do know they're about to wreck the high street. Yes. Um, this intense and very vivid culture um, starts to be destroyed, I suppose, as early as the 20s and 30s with um, the, the depression there. Um, and what it's left is still quite a powerful division in Wales about what Welshness is about and Welsh history is about. I mean, you're occasionally criticised, I think it's fair to say, by some of the, the more Welsh language um, uh, plidist elements of your uh, of your nation. Um, that's a division which has always been there, but it's about as strong now as it ever has been. Well, I... I think the criticism is, is, is there. Um, I'm not sure it's as strong. In, you know, I said those three pulses, and you mentioned the second, the Great Depression. I think the third, really, was welfareism and post-45 and a different kind of mm. society. Now all of that has gone, and, and my book is, is, a, is a eulogy, but it's also an elegy. Um, but I didn't want to, it to end on a dying fall because I think we're actually into a fourth phase, if, if that's the right way of putting it, which is that the, the different cultures of Wales are, in surprising ways, coming together now because of the new institutions, which have, one way or another, been created in Wales. So to give them vivacity at all, uh, they have to be given the breath of life, which is more than political. You know, if less than half the people vote in the elections in Wales, that's a cultural um, an error, if you want, and, and that has to be understood in terms of you build a culture or give up. And your book, which you call Memory in Society, it contains exchanges of letters and profiles and essays on writers and, and artists and intellectuals and tries to preserve some of the conversation and the wit. And I felt reading it that your hope was that if you can kind of freeze it all and put it behind uh, under hard covers, then in some manner at some point parts of this culture that you love so much can be... Uh, revived again yes, after I, death. I wouldn't take fr- <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't take freezing. I'd say that I'm trying to sing a song, um, okay. and, and, and one can maybe hear some of the tune of that. I th- you know, it's a book about consciousness, and it's also a book which which attempts to say that there was validity in some of the collective impulses of that society, which actually work for not just Wales but for. Uh, I'm tempted to quote the Prime Minister. We had a big society. Well, I mean, I find all this fascinating. It's one of the things Dye's work um, teaches me and reinforces me in this this sense that uh, human beings, all of us, are embedded in cultures. And when the cultures go, as it were, you can't bring those particular human beings back. And one of the oddities of this experiment in automatic writing at the start of the 20th century is that they communicate these supposed embodied, disembodied, deceased intelligences using cultural code... Uh, biblical and classical tags, Tennyson's and Browning, Browning's poetry with each other, in a way that was intelligible to all of the psychical researchers, but is completely in- unintelligible to us. Uh, partly because we don't read Browning and Tennyson, uh, the Bible mm. and the classics in the same way. So the idea that these people, as it were, they, uh, could go on immortally in a post-mortem realm is really inconsistent, not only with Darwinism, but with the facts of lived you, experience, which is that we're all embedded in cultures. But if the you, culture goes, we change or we go. Yes, but you can goad um, and provoke people who haven't got a particular culture 
to a sense of envy or embarrassment, perhaps, and therefore um, to, 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 to kick-start something. I, I don't think there are any patterns or templates, certainly not in the culture I've been describing, mm. uh, and I don't think it's repeatable uh, or, in that sense, translatable. Mm. But I do think, as I say, that there were values, and I'll, I'll call them moral and ethical as well, which do translate into the way people's lives are lived today and might give people some kind of sense. But it's more than that. I mean, I call the book Memory in Society because mm. having spent a, a life as a professional historian, um, it worries me that sometimes in professional history, historiography, can actually freeze in the way that you've described, Andrew. Uh, it it mm. can actually um, take people away from their sense of culture or the sense of belonging. And memory, not myth, but memory in society is, is I think, a kind of an emotional thing uh, which is, is worthwhile mm. because it does allow um, different forms of growth, different processes. Mm. Would you um, embed culture in that sense, Paul, um, in a... In a, in a in in a science. Yeah, I, was just, I was just thinking of um, Dawkins and memes, and I was just wondering if if if, if you could um, think of culture as being a set of you know this idea that memes are equipped like the culture equipped of genes and you they they're inherited and passed on if they're strong enough. And I just wonder if there's there's a sense that trouble is memes are myths. Well, <laughs> it's a little bit debatable. Let's yeah. let's just assume that they they kind of exist. And just wonder if there's sort of elements of the culture that have been passed on still. I was thinking, for instance, of, of Bevan and the NHS and the, mm. and yeah, the sure. post-war. Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, the idealism of the post-war. Mm. The kind of that was a kind of utopianism. Well, I mean, there the, 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 the was a poll um, a couple of years ago, and Bevan was the most popular man of the 20th century in Wales. Mm. You know, from all sides. Um, now, what people think they mean by Bevan is, is a different issue, but mm. that memory is there. That memory is there. Mm. Well, uh, our ability to pass on memes and, and, and cultural DNA has run out because our time has. Thank you to all my guests. Kathleen Richardson is giving that talk entitled Will Robots Take Over the World? on February the 24th at the UCL. Paul McCauley is taking part in Science Fiction and International Orders next month. Details on the Start the Week website. John Gray's The Immortalisation Commission and Di Smith's in the frame, are both out now. Next week, Courage, Boldness and Rebellion will be celebrating the art of the manifesto with Neville Brody, Susan Hillier, Alex Danchev and E.C. Osundu. But for now, thank you and goodbye.